Hello and welcome to this session in our series of videos on how to critically appraise a randomised controlled trial following the CASP checklist. In this session, we'll answer question 7, where the effects of intervention reported comprehensively. Well, let's go over all these consideration points one by one. The very first one asks, was a power calculation undertaken? Well, a power calculation is made before the study begins to calculate the sample size needed to detect a true difference between outcomes in the control and intervention groups. This will be based on previous similar studies or a pilot study. If previous similar research or a pilot study identified that the intervention has a small effect, then a power calculation based on that would result in a larger sample size being required in order to detect that small effect. If previous research or a pilot study identified that the intervention has a pronounced effect, a power calculation based on that would result in a smaller sample size being required in order to detect that large effect. The bottom line is you should always see a power calculation reported, usually in the methodology section, and if not, that's a red flag. The power calculation is based on the primary outcome measure, the only outcome for which the research has been set up for. Secondary outcomes are only there for guidance or useful for future research. Watch out for papers then that initially set up to measure effectiveness as the primary outcome, but which then focus on secondary outcomes like side effects. That could be down to the research not proving a statistically valid link for the primary outcome. A power of 80 to 90% is the standard level, but this is an arbitrary cutoff. Anything less, though, is a bit of a worry. If the authors don't manage to recruit enough people to their study, or they do, but then lots of participants drop out, we say that the study is underpowered, and it's much harder then to truly say its findings are significant. You can find lots of uh, power calculators online. You can follow the link here for one from statisticalsolutions.net. Back to our paper, then. The power calculation is reported in the supplementary material on page 819 and they recruited the amount of people, that was over 170 in each arm of the study, that the power calculation dictated. So we can answer yes to this consideration point. Our next question asks, what outcomes were measured and were they clearly specified? Well, of course, you always want to see these reported. The primary outcome was clearly specified from the start. And the secondary outcome measures were clearly specified too. Here they are clearly stated on page 810 in the methodology section where you'd expect them. Our next consideration point, how were the results expressed? For binary outcomes were relative and absolute effects reported. Well, to answer this, we can go to the results section and the tables and graphs there. The outcomes are reported clearly, though there's quite a lot of them. Table 2 pictured shows the primary and secondary outcomes as absolute values, that's a reduction in average pain score, in columns 2 and 3. It then reports the relative risk in the fourth column. You should always see reported the raw data like this before the authors then express that data in relative terms. And it's also worth considering how results are expressed as some forms can make an effect sound greater than others. A relative risk reduction, for example, will be a bigger number, so more impressive than an absolute risk reduction figure, for example. Our next consideration point asks, were the results reported for each outcome in each group at each follow-up interval? Well, yes, we can clearly see this charted for the primary outcome on figure three on page 814. If you're reading a paper where this isn't the case, that's obviously an, a big red flag and you have to wonder why that data isn't being reported. On that topic, the next consideration point asks, was there any missing or incomplete data? This is related to question three and intention to treat analysis. When there is no outcome data from a participant because they dropped out, in an intention to treat analysis, the authors impute that participant's outcome data. This is okay and very common in randomized controlled trials. What you want to see though is the authors state how they reacted to such missing data. In our paper, 
the authors state their approach to missing data and their reasoning on pages 819 and 820 in the supplementary materials section. On page 812, they also report that their findings were consistent whichever of the imputation methods described were used. So here we can answer yes again. This is common and the authors have reported how they dealt with it. Our next consideration point asks, was there differential dropouts between the study groups that could have affected the results? So the number of dropouts, also called attrition, was roughly the same across groups. You can check figure two, the consort diagram on page 812 for this. There were 14 dropouts from the placebo arm and 17 dropouts from the intervention arm. If there was a larger disparity between the two groups numbers of dropouts, that would be a red flag and may hint at the intervention being intolerable or a flaw in the study's conduct. Here though, happily, we can answer no. Our next point asks, were potential sources of bias identified? There's no real identification of bias except for this one rather stock paragraph in the discussion section on page 817. We might very well be inclined to agree with this and answer yes to this consideration point, but perhaps more consideration would have been desirable here. Our penultimate consideration hint point asks, which statistical tests were used? Well, the statistical analysis method section on page 811 tells us this. With many standard tests employed, you should always see these details provided within the methodology section of a randomized controlled trial for transparency and reproducibility of the study. If you don't see such details included, again, that's another big red flag. Our final consideration point asks, were p-values reported? Well, p-values tell you how likely it is that the results of a trial are a fluke, purely down to chance. So you ideally want to see very, very tiny p-values reported. The lower the p-value, the higher the statistical significance of the finding, the less likely it is the observed effect was a complete fluke. They're connected to confidence intervals. A p-value of 0 0.05 or less is frequently deemed to be statistically significant, but this again is an arbitrary cutoff. In our paper, p-values are reported for the primary and secondary outcomes as seen here on table one on page 813. The rightmost column shows the p-values. The vast majority of the results reported have accompanying p-values of well under 0 0.05 telling us the findings are statistically significant. Crucial for the primary endpoints of reduction in average pain, that's on the top row, we can see there is a p-value of under 0 0.001 reported, meaning that there's a less than 1 in 10,000 chance that observed effect was a fluke and not down to the intervention. So, all things considered, we can answer yes to this question. This paper comprehensively reports the effects of the intervention. Thank you. We hope you found this video helpful. If you have any questions about this training, if you need further assistance with critical appraisal, would like more video tutorials on how to critically appraise a different type of study or on other topics, please email bartshealth.library at nhs.net.